Oh, there we go. Recording in progress. That's the cue to start. So I'll just uh, give everybody a few uh, a few seconds to uh, um, to be able to join the call. I know there's a break. So it's uh, it's always nice. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I refilled on my caffeine. So. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I'll uh, just get stuck in then. Um, so yeah, so I know people are still coming in. Um, so uh, just do a little quick uh, intro. First of all, um, hi everyone and uh, welcome back to, uh, to to the government track, Map Camp 2022. In this session on, on negotiating with maps, Professor David Eaves is, is going to be joining us. Um, so P Professor David Eaves is, is a, um, a public policy and entrepreneur, an open government activist, and a negotiation expert who teaches at UCL, the University College of London in UK, and he's also head of investing at, uh, at Codevelop. Um, we'll also have Kaimar uh, Karu uh, joining us from Estonia, who's a partner in at Mind, uh, a company called Mindbridge and former Minister of Foreign Trade and Information Technology in Estonia. This is going to be a really fascinating mix of perspectives. Right, so Dave is going to connect the interest-based negotiation with boardly mapping and show how he uses the two together um, to, to get to a yes. And Kaimar is going to demonstrate how to eke out the yes, all the little assumptions by using maps to compare and contrast different contexts in a way that, uh, that really reduces friction between stakeholders. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really looking to, uh, forward to this. Um, so you'd like, let's get started, David. Over to you. Perfect. Just my mind spotlighting me, so uh, I'm gonna have my slides over my shoulder. Um, I am so excited to be here. Um, I have been a huge uh, Wordly Mapping fan for a long time, and have used it in a company that I co-founded, and in a lot of work that I do and strategy work that I'm doing. Um, but uh, sometimes people don't realize because I, I spend so much time in the government space that actually I started my career off in the negotiation space. Um, so now I teach, I'm an associate uh, professor of digital government here at the University College of London at something called the IIPP. Um, but uh, I actually started my career off working for the authors of Getting to Yes, doing negotiation consulting. And it's been actually a core skill set of my whole life because um, it's just so useful in so many different contexts. So one thing I just want to be clear about is um, I'm going to be drawing on theories and ideas that I don't want to claim as mine, but actually I have a deep literature behind them by many, many really intelligent and wonderful people, um, particularly um, Roger Fisher um, and Bill Urey, but also Bruce Patton and a number of others um, who are the authors of uh, Cortex around negotiating called Getting TS um, that has really formed the kind of the foundation of my knowledge in the space. Um, uh, just as context, I spend a lot of my time thinking about technology and transformation. Um, I started a uh, startup about 10 years ago that we exited recently um, and have advised um, a number of organizations and companies. Um, I've actually done a lot of training of people in the technology space um, from Mozilla to the Code for America fellows, the Presidential Innovation Fellows, uh, and also kind of worked on some tech policy challenges and issues negotiating with companies like Apple um, and others. Um, if you get kind of interested in some of this and the intersection between kind of the negotiation and the software development space, I actually have a keynote from almost 10 years ago at the OzCon conference, which touches on a lot of the ideas and about how I see kind of open source and negotiation being kind of, uh, or negotiation skills being core to running an effective open source project. Um, and so that may be of interesting for some people who want to find these ideas interesting, might be more to dive into there. Okay, so the first thing I wanna do um, is I just want to talk about what we mean by negotiating and, and kind of what, you know, what, what, what drives me as I think about this, what the skill actually is and what the process actually is. And so I'm going to take like, I don't know, three days of negotiation training that I normally do and compress it into about six minutes to give you a kind of a sense of, you know, how I and many think about the kind of negotiation dilemma and what makes good negotiation from bad negotiation as a context to help us understand how we might then apply it to maps. So, um, I think a lot of times when people think about negotiating, they have like this on nine, which is like, you know, um, I have like a really old, like a uh, Ford I want to sell you and you're kind of interested in buying it. And so I'm like, well, I want $50,000 for it. And you're like, well, I'll give you 500. And then we start to haggle. And I say, well, my, maybe I'll set 3000. You say, I'll give you a thousand. And then I go, well, your neighbor's going to offer me a lot more money than that. So maybe I'll go talk to them. And they say, well, you know, your car's really beat up and it's not as good shape as you think it is. So good luck with that. So we kind of threaten each other. And then, you know, maybe we kind of get closer and closer. And if we're really lucky, we come to an agreement. For many people, like this is what negotiating looks like. 
And there's a lot of challenges with this process. So one is, it's actually really hard to know um, if one is actually getting like kind of remote, like one's measuring one's success based on how, what, what, what the other person's telling you, like what they're willing to accept, not what you're willing to accept. Um, the process is also often very hard in relationships. So we're kind of threatening each other and testing each other. Um, and many, many negotiations are not as simple as kind of buying a car where maybe we might never see each other again. Many negotiations, particularly in like, you know, software development, but in many fields are the start of a relationship. They're the start of a collaboration. And so if we have this really fraught process about like what we're going to come to. We haven't built any relationship muscle in this process. In fact, quite the opposite. We've often ended up damaging it and, and kind of like testing and hurting each other or uh, pushing each other in ways that make us distrustful of the other party. And it sets us on a terrible footing for kind of a long-term partnership. Um, so while this is what is often familiar to people, um, there are other styles of negotiation, styles of negotiation that you are all engaged in all the time that look really different. And so um, that code can be explained. I'm going to try to do it in about uh, six, seven minutes. Um, but it really centers around this notion of kind of like, do you understand what your interests are? And so interests are kind of like the drivers of what you're actually trying to accomplish. So in this previous model, you had what we might call a position, which is I want $30,000 for a car. And interests are all the reasons why you're asking for that. Like maybe you think that's what fair value is, or you just want to get more money than, you know, you want to get as much money as you possibly can. But, but why do you want the money? Um, what's motivating you? What are you trying to accomplish? The interests are kind of like the underlying reasons why. In the book, Getting to Yes, there's kind of a wonderful example of this where um, two children are fighting over an orange and a parent walks into the room and that kind of parent looks at the kids and they're arguing and they pick up a knife and they think about it as any parent might. But instead they grab the orange and they chop the orange in half and they give half each orange. And one kid runs away and peels the orange and eats the fruit. The other kid runs away, peels the orange, throws away the fruit and then starts grating the zest because they want an orange flavored cake. And so each kid had a position, which is that I want the orange, but they had fundamentally different interests and interests that weren't even in conflict. One was hungry or thirsty or vitamin C deficient. And the other was like needed an orange flavored cake or had like an orange steamed party they had to prepare for. And if I had just asked the question why, I would have dug underneath what they were asking for to learn about what their interests were. Interests are kind of at the core of any effective negotiating. And, and if you uncover them, you can use them to start to generate options that both parties might find agreeable. So what are things we could do that would meet your interests and my interests? In the, in the example of the orange, one thing we could do is by just asking what their interests were, we could devise the option where maybe we peeled the orange and gave all the fruit to one party and all the peels to the other party, and we'd actually double the value of the outcome um, at no cost to anyone. And then we want to be thinking about what are like standards that you know we see out in the marketplace or in the universe that like help us figure out what feels fair what have others done what are precedent what does the law require us to do those are kind of constraints that might cause one to choose one option or another these three things are kind of what make for a really effective negotiation and i'm willing to bet almost anything that all of you at some point in your life have been in a conversation where you've been using all three of these things um to put it more bluntly all of you have friends or colleagues that you have high trust relationships with where when things go really sideways or things aren't going well, you're able to grab them and go into a conference room or into the living room or into the kitchen and sit down and be like, hey, uh, here's the impact this is having on me. This is what I'm really trying to look for. Uh, here's some paths I see out for us. And they go, well, this is what I'm looking for. What feels fair? And that might be explicitly or implicitly stated. And you begin to just hash it out. You would never call that a negotiation, but that's exactly what's going on. Negotiations are not just with people that we find difficult or hard, they're happening all the time in our lives. And you are exemplifying like really critical negotiation skills all the time, often with people you have that you trust. And the reason you can do it with, more easily with them is what makes the kind of dialogue interest around interest options and legitimacy possible is that you have a relationship where you feel like you can talk about these things, where you feel it's safe and you're, you can actually disclose what your interests are and you have an effective way of communicating so you can transmit that information, that data to them so they can incorporate it. If your relationship with them is highly distressful, then you often don't wanna talk about these things, you don't wanna share your interests and it leads to a much more conflictual relationship. So a precondition to getting to that kind of great conversation where interest options and legitimacy are happening is to have relationship communication built in. 
Then once you figure out like all the options, you begin to narrow in the best one, you then have to make a choice. Do I wanna move forward with this option and work with this person? If the answer is no, then you gotta go figure out what your alternatives are. What are the things that you could do that don't involve that party that you could do on your own or maybe spend time trying to figure out if somebody else was willing to work with you to achieve those aims? Or you figure out, yes, let's do this together. And you kind of figure out what are we actually committing to? Let's document that and get really clear about it. So a great negotiation starts up here at the top and works its way down. And a dysfunctional negotiation, one where you're haggling, is often one where people are threatening you with like, you know, well, I'm not gonna treat you well, I'm gonna treat you badly, or they yell at you or communicate poorly, all trying to force you to say yes to something that you don't wanna say. And they wanna avoid talking about interests and options and legitimacy. They don't wanna have that conversation. They're trying to force you to commit to something that you don't wanna to commit to. Now, I can't promise that every negotiation ends up kind of working this way. There are lots of times when it's, it, it can't. But my job as a negotiator is to try to really try to move into this process and think about it. So I hope this is kind of a helpful overview to help you understand like how I think a lot of master negotiators are thinking is they're trying to elicit people's interests so they can recombine them to create lots of creative options to find new ways to solve the problem and not just zero in on the position that a given party is stating that tells us nothing about their actual goals. Okay. You, in the tech space, I always like to joke, this stuff gets harder, especially online. Often we don't have great relationships with like the people we work with in large projects so the relationships are weak. And then we might be communicating over email where the communication density is much, much lower, the throughput's much, much slower. And so we end up with all sorts of like kind of silly mistakes where, you know, what do I mean when I say this line? Like, I didn't say he was stupid. I didn't say he was stupid. I didn't, I didn't say, I didn't say he was stupid. I think he is. I didn't say he was stupid. Like each one of those sentences means something fundamentally different. And when they're all written with no italics, it's hard to tell. So we actually are often online stuck in these situations of low communication capacity that leads to lots of the distrust and challenges. And then um, and if you're in an open source project or in a free association project, your alternatives are really good. You just go work on a different project. And so everybody's alternatives are really strong. And so um, it makes exit really easy. So often I find people in technology projects, particularly online, have, have particularly tough negotiation problems on their hand. This is why I think this is such interesting literature and helpful literature for those in the open source space, but for software in general. Okay, let's connect this now to mapping. I'm so excited about this. Um, so I have three ideas I wanted to share with the group. Um, uh, are you sort of kind of like increasing complexity? So the first one is I just want everybody to recognize how mapping begins to already, more than mapping begins to already show us the places where negotiation is likely to take place and where conflict is more likely to arise. And I, I've seen this both in the work I've done in government and even in the software space and, and even in the company that I help manage. So, you know, often when I'm advising people in government, you, you kind of go like, you know, you have a team like a Code for America team or a Presidential Innovation Fellows team that's gonna go in and they're like, yeah, we're gonna go in, we're gonna help change things. And already you're engaged in negotiation because you know, the city or the government you're going into, like, well, the mayor has objectives and goals that they wanna see have happen. And those may or may not completely align with the objectives of the CIO, which is the person the team may be more likely to be reporting to. And in fact, those may be different than the goals and the objectives of the people on the ground who are doing the work. And then of course, you as a team may have your own interests and objectives that you're trying to accomplish. And so right away, you're actually thrown into a very complex negotiation on how you're gonna to try to solve problems. Now, I see a very similar dynamic anytime I open up a Wordly map and you know, let's pull up this classic slide from Simon where we have a talk about our like, um, I'm hoping there's new terminology, I haven't seen it yet, but that kind of pioneer settlers and town planners. And already, you know, Simon goes out of his way in this, I pulled this old blog post of his where he's like, pioneers are brilliant, settlers are brilliant, town planners are brilliant. And that means there's like zero guarantee that they're all gonna get along. Um, in fact, there's sometimes almost kind of like built in conflict between them. So, you know, when Simon shows this slide, if everybody looks happy, it's like, oh yes, we're all in our bubble and we're all doing our own thing. And he has like these wonderful quotes of like, oh, what I need is a Kanban board and what I need is a skunk works. And I kind of like have redone those quotes with kind of behaviors and actions. I feel like I often see on teams, which is like, Customers may like the 3D Viz tool, but it's as reliable as the idiots who built it. And like, they have very strong judgments about the fact that the pioneers don't really build reliable things. Um, and therefore, as a result, they have to end up servicing them or thinking about it or worried about how the customer is gonna be perform. Or, 
you know, um, what I need is a platform team that can actually move at the speed of our customers because I'm trying to innovate new things. It's kind of, for me, a classic line that one might see from the pioneers who are trying to um, meet customer needs and kind of adapt quickly and are stuck with a platform team that's on a very long development cycle and is really worried about, um, you know, kind of like stability and making sure that nothing breaks. And they're like, no, we need to move faster. Why do those idiots not get it? And so often there's built in conflict in this map. And I think one of the things I just wanted to convey right away is, we need to understand that, accept that, and embrace it, and, and recognize that each one of these teams are brilliant, but they may not recognize the value of the other teams or their brilliance, and in fact, um, may find their behaviors deeply, deeply troubling and frustrating, and that can lead to conflict. And so um, I always spend a lot of time trying to talk to everybody about how, like, you know, yes, your team is great, but it depends on what the other teams are doing, and we really need to build respect for what those other teams are doing. And in government, that gets manifest in like kind of what I sometimes refer and others refer to as the digital versus IT problem, which is, you know, you often have the IT team who's responsible for the infrastructure and, you know, kind of like the deeper parts of the stack who are generally kind of like not really paid attention to. And then the flashy digital team that's supposed to fix everything and gets kind of like all the, the, the kudos from the, from the politicians and who kind of like look at the IT team as being slow moving and stuck in the 1990s and not getting it. But actually we really need to go to a place where it's like the digital and IT team and they know how to work together. Uh, this I think is like a, a core, core challenge for the digital people that I work with um, is getting them over a perceived lack of respect for the IT team. Okay, that's my first like very, very casual thought. Let's go deeper. Okay, idea number two. I, I love to think about how we can negotiate with maps. So if you go back to this idea of interest options legitimacy that are at the core of interest-based negotiating theory, what if we took those and we said, made those the axes of a worldly map? So now we have parties, interests, standards, options as our kind of cores of our map. You could then begin to think about, well, what would a negotiation look like? Well, I might have my parties and I could rank what their interests are and the options are from a preference of strong to weak. So imagine two people are trying to negotiate on kind of go on a vacation. Well, we have two parties now. They can begin to outline what their interests are. So party one may want to like not be anywhere cold and they want to have a good time with party two and they don't want to travel too far. And party two has their own interests, some of which are actually common shared interests with the party one and some that are different, but maybe not in conflict, just different. And then you could use those to begin to figure out what are the common interests by highlighting those and then use those to kind of begin to think about, oh yeah, like, sorry, or like create bubbles to talk about like where there are different but not conflicting interests, where there are common interests, and then use those to start generating possible, um, you know, standard legitimacy. So like, how would we know if somewhere's cold? Well, let's go to the weather channel and see like what the locations look like year round. And then use those to generate options. Like, could we go on a cruise line or a staycation or go to Whistler in British Columbia near where I'm from? All of those things like might be interesting ways and you can begin to look at the density of the lines to figure out what makes sense. Okay, and then finally, let me talk about number three, which is layering negotiation onto existing worthy maps. This gets me unbelievably excited. So I think, as I mentioned before, like embedded in worthy maps are a whole bunch of, of, of negotiations. And that's because the people who are kind of sitting in the custom build area, as Simon himself notes, have a set of interests that are different than the sets of interests that people who tend to be in the kind of commodity utility side of thing. And so um, here, when we're in this side, actually we have fewer standards of legitimacy because everything's new. So we don't have things to compare it against. Whereas when we're over in the commodity side, we should be able to know exactly what is the best possible option by measuring against what others are doing and what the standards are that are out there. And here, like the range of options could be many, many over here. So it's a lot of uncertainty over here. There should be two or three very standardized op like options that we should be focused on. Then I began to think about, well, what if you then took a worldly map? So this is actually my looking at um, Simon's old, uh, that same worldly map I showed before that Simon uses a lot of his presentations. You can begin to layer the interests of say the customers next to the various pieces and talk about like, well, what are the interests that they have, right? So like, there's no features really needed, on, no, no new features on the land registry that customers want. So we should be pushing this over. It's actually like, that, that could get pushed over. And here, like, they have a strong interest here and strong interest there, and we can start to document those. And you can start to actually layer that on with interest from, like, say, like, the legal team. What interest do they have? And then start to compare those about, like, what are, like, the ones that, like, they have in, what interests do they have in common and what interests they have different? And so it could be that, like, legal's like, no, 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 no. Um, 
Um, here, like, uh, we want to make this kind of like less standardized, whereas the customer team's like, no, we should be outsourcing this to WordPress. Whereas the legal team's like, no, we have unique things. Or the inverse, the, the dev team's like, we have unique features. We want to get this actually more customized because we want to do new unique things. And legal's like, we only see risk in that. We don't want to do that. So you could see the parties pulling you in different directions. I'm really fascinated about how we could like layer an entire negotiation element over on top of, map, of maps. Those are my three kind of crazy ideas. I hope these were fun and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. That was brilliant, David. That's really cool ideas, love it. So uh, without further ado, Kaimer. Thank you. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Okay, hopefully that showed up, yep. Okay, um, so I will be also be talking about negotiating with maps. Uh, maps is one. Maps are one of the tools that I use when I work with organizations uh, uh, around the world. Um, I usually focus on everything digital. So as, as Steve mentioned in the beginning, um, I, I came from the private sector um, to the public sector to the government in Estonia um, to uh, as the minister of, of uh, foreign trade and IT and. Most of you probably know that uh, Estonia is quite uh, advanced um, in everything digital on, on the government level. So uh, it doesn't mean that we don't have challenges in Estonia. We have lots of challenges. Uh, one of those being now we are getting um, into legacy systems because the systems that we did build um, or pioneered uh, in the beginning have now started um, getting quite old. Uh, so we need to address that as well. Um, and um, which means that we need to start using new, te new technologies, rebuilding what we built before. And uh, as it is the case in, in many organizations, but also, um, well, states essentially, you don't always think about um, the technical debt to the level, to a level that you should when you build systems. Um, so you, you will be, kind of, you will end up dealing with uh, technical debt um, pretty soon. So we're kind of, we are in that uh, situation right now. But overall, still things are going quite well. Um, now, so when I work with organizations, um, both in the public and private sectors, they are struggling with quite a few things. Uh, digitalization overall, uh, moving beyond, um, let's add this digital layer to uh, stuff that we had before um, and towards, um, let's use digital capabilities to rebuild and rethink uh, the way we do our work. So not just a layer of digital, but actually utilizing what digital can, can offer. Um, how to um, support innovation in the organization, how to deal with rapid changes, um, how to figure out how to navigate complexity and deal with unknown future. Now, um, during the COVID pandemic, of course, um, one of the challenges, but also opportunities came from uh, hybrid work and hybrid learning. So lots of people started working from home. Uh, but also e-learning um, solutions uh, for students uh, became much more popular. Again, in Estonia, we, it was not that bad for us because we had already built uh, most of these systems before. Um, and the question was more about the, the load on the systems rather than the functionality. So we, we took, it took a few months for us to fix things, but we managed. Um, so we had um, students, teachers, parents around, around the country um, joining various uh, e-learning -plat e platforms. Um, on, a, on a daily basis. But also in addition to, to technical challenges, uh, organizations are dealing with the challenge that we have more stakeholders, or it seems that we have more stakeholders. So the public opinion uh, for, the, for the private sector and the public sector alike, uh, the public opinion is, is more visible in a way. Social media is one of the ways how it has become more visible. Uh, but also the stakeholders around the world um, at least for organizations, what they are forcing organizations to do is take a stance, a stance on, on various kinds of ethical questions and, and make ethical choices. Um, otherwise, the company would, le would lose their customers. So ethics has become a major, um, major part in decision making for organizations. And of course, AI and, and cyber threats as well. So today, so as, as I mentioned before, so I'm, I'm, Maps um, is one of the tools that I use uh, when I help um, companies with these kinds of challenges. And so today I, I wanted to choose one, one of these challenges, which of course uh, is also an opportunity uh, to go into more detail and then use as an example. So that would be the sustainability. Um, so let's look at um, the sustainability challenge in organizations 
and how we can use maps uh, and negotiating with maps to, to help with that. So first of all, of course, globally, we can look at the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 of them. Uh, most of the countries, or let's say many of the countries at least, but I would say most of the countries around the world have um, chosen an approach to this already. So they, they have figured out how they would like to address these. Uh, many of the countries do publish uh, their reports as well, um, which are um, freely available. Um, and uh, of course, as it often happens with reports, not everything that is written uh, on the glossy pages in the report is true, but at least it shows a direction of, of how, the, uh, how the country is thinking and, and which way they're going. And also it helps to, uh, to find um, things that didn't work for other countries so you can avoid some of the mistakes if the same situation applies to you as well. Um, they are quite abstract, so countries have been making them more, um, less abstract for themselves, and of course, organizations are doing the same. Now, when it comes to organizations in, in specific, um, there is the, the question of the triple bottom line. So essentially, how to measure uh, the organization's growth um, or, um, or what, what are the positive effects of, of or on the company? Um, so we're not just talking about the economic growth anymore, so we're just not, not just talking about profit, but we are also talking about environment and, and social aspects. And this is a challenge for organizations, for many organizations, um, because lots of managers, uh, mid-level, but also top-level managers, they have been trained to mostly focus on economic growth. They have also been trained um, somewhat to ignore some of the other aspects because they stand in the way of achieving said economic growth. So now they have to rethink. And the challenge in organizations, but the positive one is, it's not just for the managers to figure out how to do all of this in the organization, it's, it's for everybody in that organization. So the organizations where communication works better, where trust is higher, where um, people's involvement um, and input is appreciated, it's easier to achieve. Um, in other organizations, uh, which are very top down um, and still focus mostly on, on the economic aspects, this is quite difficult. Um, some of these concepts here, some of the things that you have to think about, they sound, I would say, almost alien uh, to some of, some of the leaders. So there's a challenge. And the challenge is how to translate all of that um, into what the organization should be doing. And the question is also on what, on what level it should be done. Should it be done on the strategic top level management level? Uh, or should it be done on each of the level in the organizations, or should it be done just for the experts uh, who are, in that sense, at, at the bottom of the hierarchy? So last year, uh, last year TSO published a, a book called uh, Sustainability and Digi in Digital and IT. This is a book where, with four, so three other authors, um, we try to put together. Uh, practical guidance on how to approach uh, sustainability when it comes to digital uh, from two aspects. Uh, one is when you try to address sustainability in, sustainability in the organization, um, how to make sure that the approach itself is sustainable. Uh, sustainable. Um, so when you choose technical solutions uh, for those to be sustainable, but also how to use those solutions then to help the organization to become more sustainable. So not just one or the other, but um, so yes, choosing sustainable solutions and using those solutions to help the organization to become more, more sustainable. So it's a collaboration between Axelos and Defra. Um, and it's, it's built um, around um, the, um, the improve, improvement model, which I will talk about briefly as well. Um, and as I said, it's, it's meant to be practical guidance. And um, one of the, aspects that we really tried to address in this was to make sure that it can be used by everyone in the organization in the sense that you don't have to work in IT to be able to do that or in the digital team, uh, which is usually uh, faster running, uh, as David said. Um, so whatever your level in the organization, you should be able to find guidance from here how to address sustainability in the organization. Okay. Um, so there's a few tools in there which uh, can be used in organizations to address this. Uh, from the ITIL side of uh, side of the uh, the room, so ITIL um, is the service management framework, or IT service management framework. Um, ITIL now, in the latest version, includes um, something called guiding principles. So these are the things. Let's say these are the principles that you can use uh, in decision making when um, you have autonomy. 
in a sense that you're not being told how to do things. You have to figure out how to achieve these things. But there are certain things like these kind of principles you can use to figure out which uh, path might be better or which path might be worse. So to allow uh, teams to make their own decisions, you have guiding principles, and then the guiding principles are translated into how it applies to uh, sustainability and addressing that in the organization. You also have things like the maturity model from DEFRA uh, for, for sustainability in the book. And now kind of coming back to the, the challenge of addressing sustainability in the organization. Very often in discussions, uh, in my experience, um, the, the view is that sustainability needs to be addressed uh, on the strategic level. And, they, and I, do not, I, I do not disagree with that. Yes, it ha absolutely has to be addressed at the strategic level. But the hope that it will trickle down uh, from strategic to tactical and then operational and everything will be uh, fine and dandy and just everyone will do exactly what was proposed on the strategic level and the uh, uh, outcomes will be exactly as planned. Uh, well, this will never ever happen. So the question is, is it only the strategic level that should address sustainability in the organization or also the technical and operational level? And I would say that in addition to the strategic approach, um, where at least support for sustainability is needed, the so addressing sustainability on the operational level uh, provides valuable insight um, and material to both tactical and strategic levels as well. So in a way, in many cases, in many organizations, it's actually easier to start with sustainability, sustainability on the operational level than it is on the tactical level or strategic level. It is difficult to do when there is zero support for sustainability initiatives on the strategic level. But if there is at least some support on the strategic level, then small steps on the operational level can show an example uh, for other teams, for the whole organization. They can deliver success, success quite quickly, um, serve as role models, but also show what, which kind of things work and which do not in that organization. So for anyone who is interested in introducing sustainability initiatives in the organization, one of the messages is that don't be stressed out when there is not enough strategic focus on this. A lot can be done on the operational level and the success on operation level will help build momentum and will help, will help bring more strategic level um, support to initiatives as well. Now in situations where um, let's say things can be more or less controlled or there's more predictability, there is, there is this improvement model that could be used um, that starts from what is the vision to where are we now, uh, where do we want to be, how do we get there, then take action, did we get there, and how to keep the momentum going. So this is an improvement model for organizations and teams, and the way it works in the organizations, it's, it's, it's in a way fractal. Um, so this model um, could run for it, the initiative, it could run for the team, and then it can also run for the whole organization. So the organization's improvement model then consists of multiple team or initiative level improvement models. And again, coming back to the strategic level here, of course, it would be wonderful if the, if the organization's vision includes aspects of sustainability already, but for many organizations, that is not the case. Um, although we have been talking about sustainability for quite some time, many organizations have not included this in their vision or in their strategy. Um, so in that sense, or in that case, uh, what you're really looking at is where are we now? Where do we want to be? And how do we get there? So that would be the first level of focus on the team or initiative level. Um, and then the same applies that once you have done this, so this will never ever stop in a way. Um, so these initiatives or improvements uh, keep running. Uh, if you run them just as projects that will just end at one day, um, the success is quite limited. So you have to figure out in your organization how to make sure um, that the momentum um, kind of is gathered, right? Um, and communication is, is one of the key aspects here as well. But yes, so it's not just the vision level where you need to start. Um, you can take the existing vision of the organization and you can show how um, meeting sustainability objectives actually helps to, uh, to fulfill that mission, uh, vision and mission. Um, so this can be used in some cases, but there are of course situations where proper planning like this uh, cannot be done. Um, I have marked one of these as a, with an asterisk, so I'll come back to that uh, on my last slide. So why 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 that is the case? Now, kind of briefly going through the um, 
benefits uh, from using mapping in, in these initiatives. So based on experience, how mapping um, has been useful um, when addressing these kinds of sustainability initiatives, uh, addressing challenges in organizations in kicking off uh, sustainability initiatives. So first of all, it help, they, they help to kick off discussions about supply chains. Uh, I mean, they help to improve awareness of dependencies and risks something that might not be obvious for, for many people in an organization. They just don't think about these things on a daily basis. Secondly, uh, they help to identify and visualize assumptions. And this is not how, the, how things are, have always been done here, um, of, uh, approach to, to doing the work. Um, they help to identify duplication, both in use and in progress. That means that sometimes when teams get together and they uh, work around the map, they realize that some of the work in progress that they have thought uh, would be an improvement is actually duplication of existing work or duplication of another improvement, which will then lead to waste um, and also disconnect between the teams. So identify those uh, situations. Um, they also help teams to understand their context um, and their sphere of, sphere of control. Um, so not all teams can influence everything in the organization. Um, but the maps help to help them to see where they are, uh, both in terms of the organization, but also in terms of, of co-creating value um, with the customer. So what is their role in that? Um, so they see what are the dependencies who depend on them, uh, which way things are going and what the role might be in the, in the improvements. Um, they also help identify scaffolding disguises objectives. Um, so that's, this would be probably a separate talk on its own, um, but very often, uh, things like frameworks and methods and techniques are introduced to the company as objectives. So we implement X and the uh, result then will be that now we have X, uh, which is kind of mixing up um, scaffolding, which is there to help to achieve objectives um, and, and making these things as objectives. Um, so implementing X um, should not be the objective or it cannot be, but often it, it becomes that. So maps help to identify those. Um, they help to challenge the not invented here approach, uh, as it's easier to you kind of focus on business value uh, when you look at the map uh, in the team and between the teams. Um, it, they show or demonstrate the importance of perspective, so impressions uh, of things differ, and also things move around. So you might create a map of something today, and then one week later, when you do the same, it will be different. It will definitely be different when you do this with another team today, but even with the same team next week, it is most likely to, to be somewhat different because people have started thinking about certain things and they know more or they know different. Um, then um, they help to identify initiatives uh, that either can be kicked off now, um, the ones that need analysis, the ones that need information or just need, to, um, need actions immediately. Um, so identify these kinds of initiatives. And then lastly, um, and I would say this is very, very important, uh, maps help um, to prompt questions from within the teams rather than push valuable or kind of, yeah, useful questions on them. So you don't come in as a consultant and tell them, well, you're doing this wrong and you're doing that, you're doing that wrong. You are helping the teams to figure out what could be improved and visualization of the situation um, and the trends um, on the map helps a lot with that. And of course, I, like, I wouldn't be able to deliver a presentation in today's world without mentioning Kanevin. Um, so Kanevin as the framework, I'm gonna go back uh, just once. Um, the point before the last, so identified in, um, initiatives to be kicked off now, analysis and so on. So Kanevin as a framework helps uh, leaders, decision makers, but also professionals doing the work, figure out which is which, so essentially, uh, which kind of approaches, techniques, methods, and so on to use for which kinds of initiatives, where you can act immediately, where you need to act immediately, where you need more analysis, or where you need to more probing and try to figure out how the system actually works. So this is an extremely valuable framework that I encourage everyone to learn unless they have done so already. And then my very last slide, if sustainability is your thing, there's another session at uh, 5.30 today. Um, so where sustainability will also be discussed. So if you want to learn more about that, uh, then I think that session for most likely will be quite useful for you as well. And that's all from me. Thank you. That was great. 
Thank you, Como. Yeah, it's it's really did sound like uh, towards the end there that um, a few points uh, jumped out at me, like yeah, the sphere of control and prompting questions uh, for, from the team. It it all seems like you know empowering people, right? So trying to empower people in, in negotiations is that common across uh, across both? Like David, is that something that uh, that you see as well? That empowering other people actually helps in a negotiation. Oh, you're on mute. Let's see. Sorry, it can. I mean, the most important thing is, is that um, the people engaged in negotiation have to have a clear understanding of what the interests are that they have and the capacity to be able to shift options. So if, if you're delegating, but you're delegating to someone who can only parrot what the options are that the team wants and have no capacity to play with the other side's interests and understand their own interests well, interests well enough to be able to create new possible options, then you're not really setting that person up for success or the negotiation. So it's delegating is important, but it's like, what are you empowering them to do? And then what do they understand? And so this again, like with the interest piece is like, are you sitting down and are, are they understanding all of the interests of your team members and your side so that they can then go and be emboldened to come back with a possibly very different answer than you thought, but one that satisfies your interests. Yeah. And, and yeah. from, from okay. the consultant point of view, um, I found it to be quite important to, to give the teams the tools to manage things themselves going forward. So empowerment kind of works, kind of helps with that. So you, you don't make them dependent on you, uh, but you actually do give them the tools to, to, uh, uh, to address the challenges. And, and when the questions come from them and when the solutions also come from them, you're not really there to tell them how to do things. Well, in most cases, at least, you are there to help them to essentially to create an environment for them to be able to do the things that out of which many they have known for quite some time that those should be done to so help them to um, to kind of create this supportive environment for this and of course empowerment to actually do that yes so david i really love the 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 idea that you have that you close with there um, so your idea number three right showing uh, interests on a map and two thoughts occurred to me. I don't know if you could bring that up again, um, but um, but yeah. So the two thoughts occurred to me, and maybe I'll just uh, uh, make sure that I can spotlight this so that everybody can see you again. Um, so yeah. So um, I had uh, the idea of uh, um, showing the the flow of interests on a map was one idea. So and that's something that you could do is like speak to uh, all the different uh, parties and and try and show maybe in different colors. Um, uh, the, their flow of interest. Um, but after having that thought, I, I then realized that um, that it may well be that the interest is best represented on a map as a form of inertia um, and uh, mm. as forcing functions, right? So so then I, I started thinking that, uh, that you could add the different perspectives of, of different people as uh, forms of inertia, perhaps color-coded by their the, the source of that inertia. It could be like different departments have got their own their own colors or something like that. Um, and um, and you could do the same sort of thing with the with the arrows, right? So, the um, where do we where do we want to, uh, to to intervene? What kind of forcing functions do we want to, you know, what plays do we want to make, right? So um, I just thought I would put that idea out there. Um, yeah, and I, for me, like I like this idea of like the the product team may say, oh, the website needs to have new features so that we can better meet our customers that we have to build in house or custom. So they want to pull it this way. Whereas the legal team might be saying they're like, no, we can't do custom reviews of every single web page. Um, that's too onerous in the legal department. And they actually want to keep it in commodity or push it further into commodity. They're like, actually, we want this to all like standardize. And so just to understand like who's pulling a component in which direction could itself be really helpful to then begin to dig in and be like, okay, well, which interests are actually more and critical to the enterprise now? Yeah. Nice one. Then there were other things that um, that uh, so we had a related discussion with um, uh, in in the mapping across government uh, session earlier. Um, so in there I was talking with Leon about the the idea of representing sentiment analysis uh, about a, a an upcoming change, um, right? So resistance to change, perhaps. Um, you know, are you for it? Are you against it? Are you neutral? So representing that kind of thing on on a map as well, and it seems very very related to uh, to, um, to to the work that you're thinking of there. So. Um, I, I don't want to take up all the time. Um, I realized that somebody had their hand up, so I'm just going to uh, to check over there. Or have you put your hand down? No. If if you want to put it back up, there we go. Okay, I'm going to allow you to talk. So, Marin. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, 
I've been very interested uh, uh, in, in negotiations and in mapping and um, actually uh, had quite a few uh, critical uh, negotiations, uh, one of them being selling my company. So I became uh, uh, <laughs> uh, an expert uh, due, to, uh, due to a need. <laughs> Uh, but back then, I wasn't I wasn't using Wartley mapping, but I, I definitely did a lot of mapping the situation, uh, trying to understand the situation. But one of the things I just saw come up in the comments is saying, um, uh, and that assuming your counter counterparty is crazy, evil, or stupid can be deeply debilitating when at the negotiation table. But I think the assure like getting to yes uh, really assumes that your counterpart is rational and. Um, I think in a lot of negotiations, that's actually not the case, or at least the ones that I've been involved with. <laughs> um, and I, I feel that, um, yeah, th th I seem to miss that a bit, uh, sort of that that aspect here in in the, in the maps that I've seen here right now. Um, have so, you ever tried to try to map uh, part of that? Well, so I think I would. So one is I push back very aggressively on a counterpart not being rational. Um, I think the bar for achieving that is exceptionally high, like like exceptionally high. Um, a counterparty may want to hurt you. That may be their objective. It doesn't make them irrational. It makes them having a history of feeling frustrated or betrayed. A team may hate another team or not want to have that team be successful because they feel like that team's undermined them in the past. That's not a mm -hmm. form. I don't consider that to be form of irrational. In fact, all it does is it really stresses the need to go back and and really look at what's going on at, at, at a higher order in the negotiation. So if all you're saying is all I want to do is spend my time in this circle right here, I'm like, you can't do that ignoring these things up here. Um, there's a history and a context that that negotiation is taking place in. And so we, you have to unpack that and then be like, okay, well, how do we get to a place where you know, my disadvantage is not something that you perceive as a win, but we actually understand what are your core interests that we could satisfy. Now, that's not to say that it's impossible to run into an irrational actor, but I would say in most business contexts where you have choice, if you truly ran into a truly irrational actor, you should definitely look to your to all your alternatives because a fundamentally irrational actor cannot be negotiated with. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so... <clears throat> So, so I think it's maybe something that's very uh, that happens a lot in the space of selling companies because I've I've had a uh, I've then coached somebody else that was in a similar position and I saw the same patterns happening, uh, where basically the interests were continuously shifting from the counterpart, right? And because well, also some of the things that you've mentioned, right? They they feel hurt in a past relationship, and so uh, I, I think there's a lot of tools in the getting to yes school of negotiation that help you keep the conversation going, but at some point it wasn't moving forward and it. it what helped me in that case was actually never split the difference and a sort of a different approach of, yep. of talking to people. Um, but uh, if you start to map it, what you start to see is that the interests were continuously shifting, <laughs> and, and that that's uh, that was the irrationality to me. So I was I was just curious to see if you um, if there's there's things that you've done here uh, leveraging that with Wartley maps, like visualizing that in some way or form. For me, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think I've thought deeply enough about that in the wordly mapping context. And there's definitely lots of practices that I feel um, exist in both getting to yes and the never split the difference worlds, where there are ways of dealing with people who have shifting interests or are sharing interests in ways that are disingenuous to kind of punish behavior. So I, yeah. I think the danger is people think getting to yes is like always a soft, cuddly way of negotiating. But I think you can be incredibly firm and tough as a negotiator, adhering to that model. Um, so, but I think that those are kind of more negotiation strategy questions. And I don't want to overdo yeah. worthy mapping by trying to make it solve all problems. Yeah. No, okay. All right. Thanks for, uh, thanks for your answer. <laughs> thanks, Ryan. So I think we've got one more uh, minute left. Um, so I'm going to go with them. Um, yeah. So we, we've all got the UK in common, it seems. Um, so David, I know you mentioned, um, Came from Vancouver via Boston, Kaimar, you're straddling Estonia and UK. For me, it's it's uh, Eastern Canada and UK. Um, and I'm sure there's really um, like nuances um, of, of how you negotiate in different cultures. Um, so you've probably heard of, uh, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing the, the name correctly, but Geert uh, Hofstede uh, developed a theory of six uh, cultural dimensions. Um, so I was wondering if, if you've used those uh, before, and, and if so, then how we might make use of Wardley mapping and Hofstede together uh, to improve the nuance of, of how we negotiate. Nope. 
Sorry, I think you're on mute again, David. I was going to ask if Kymer wants to take a few, our first crack. <laughs> um, so the short answer is no, not in that way. Uh, the slightly longer answer is what I've been, I can't say I have been surprised by this, but it has been a pleasant experience in a way that regardless of various cultural differences between, uh, between organizations working in Europe, the US, Asia, but also like just within Europe, there are so many things that are common in terms of like, when, you, when you use mapping. So the, the things like the aha, right? So the realization of something just standing in front of a map or the re realization that another team that you might not like that much, once you see how they think, once you see how they map things out together or uh, together with you on, on, or on a separate map, the, the feeling that um, those people might be idiots disappears in many cases. Yep. So when you have this conflict in, inside the organization where perhaps the incentives are not, are not aligned or whatever the reason, um, and you think that essentially this other team is pure evil and they always do stupid and wrong things, once you see how they think, once you're able to uh, stand in front of a map with them and discuss certain things, a lot of that disappears. And that's, I would say, universal uh, in, my my, in my experience um, across the world. Yeah, yeah. cool, brilliant. Um, so yeah, so I think we're, we've, got to, we've got to call it there. Um, so we've got other sessions uh, coming in after this. So we're gonna have to wrap up, unfortunately. There's loads more that I know we could, uh, could discuss. Um, uh, so there, I'd like to move things over into, uh, into the VFairs chat at this point. Um, so if you've got any more questions, then, uh, then just reach out there. Um, so thanks again, David and Kaima, for, for joining us today. Thank it's you. Brilliant. Thank you. Bye for now.